Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to the dark side of your emotional needs, status. So how the need for status can lead to bullying and self-destruction. So riches, strength, height, slenderness, muscularity, being the best at something, being the worst, being the funniest, being the rudest, being the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the most aggressive, the most notorious, being top dog, uh, top cat or top gorilla or official, wearing the latest clothes or uniform, owning the most land, having the most attractive or dominant partner, a bigger house, the best vacations, knowing the right people, knowing the most people, signaling the most virtue. Status isn't about being these things, status is about being seen to be or to have these things relative to other people. But like any legitimate human need, wanting to be recognised can easily morph from a need to a demanding, all-consuming greed. Status is a constant in human life, though much of the time we don't think about it because it's everywhere and takes so many forms. So why is the drive for status to be seen a certain way so strong? We all need some sense of control to avoid feeling helpless and hopeless. You see it in infants striving for independence. One of my own earliest memories, I think it's a real one, was of feeling outraged at being stuck in my cot and managing to climb out of the cot. The drive to walk, feed oneself and talk are all about gaining more control. The need for recognition, attention and esteem merge into what we call status. When we feel recognised, appreciated and respected, we have more of a sense of control, we have status. And feeling valued and admired for who or what we are can meet the need for attention and personal power in spades. Status is a kind of frozen, focused, sustainable way of eliciting attention from people. And high status, wide recognition helps us live longer and healthier lives. Actors and directors who win Oscars live longer than uh, those merely nominated for Oscars, on average. The thought of seeking status for its own sake has distasteful connotations for many of us, but lack of status can cause real problems, including dying younger and having worse mental and physical health outcomes, and you can see the references in, in the written article for this piece. Being at the bottom of the pile, low in the pecking order, or perhaps worse, suffering a loss of status, seems toxic not just for humans, but for other animals too. Conversely, feeling appreciated can help foster healthy self-esteem. We like to feel esteemed for what we are and what we can do. In this way, social status, being and feeling recognised for our position, whether it's a manager, worker, mother or good friend, helps us feel our place in the world. But many clients suffer because they feel unappreciated or invisible, unrecognised. So the higher the position in the hierarchy we occupy, the greater health, self-esteem, happiness and longevity we tend to enjoy. So status matters, but if status is abused or becomes all-consuming, it turns into a pernicious poison. We feel envy when we dislike the fact that someone has or is something we would like to have or be. Envy is essentially resentment of another's status, and advertisers know this. You know, so we look at um, status updates online. Be the envy of your friends is a perennial advertising message, but why would you want your friends to suffer envy? Much of human behaviour consists of instinctive or conscious attempts to gain higher status, and certainly advertising plays on that. We fight, some of us more than others, to rise in the dominance hierarchy in whatever form it may take. And in this series I explore the dark side of what are, in balance, healthy and vital emotional needs. You know, we all need to drink water, and we should do so when we need it, but drinking engine oil or even too much water can kill us. There are, of course, different kinds of status. You know, conspicuously displaying wealth is the most obvious kind, but hierarchies come in many different flavours. Even the sentiment, status doesn't matter to me, i.e. I'm above status, may be a status signal of some kind. But one thing's for sure, the drive for status, while inherent and instinctive, no matter what we might tell ourselves, can lead us to some very dark places. I don't know who I'm supposed to be, 
is something we hear people say sometimes. One risk of focusing solely on status is that we can lose ourselves in the process. So take my client Jeff, you know, Jeff was driven. Uh, he always had been second is first loser. That's what he told me his dad used to say to him at school. Jeff's whole life had been a struggle to be the best and not just the best that he could be, but the best that anybody could be. Jeff had come to see me because he'd hit another patch of depression, a signal from his deep self that his life wasn't working the way he was currently living it. His workaholism was destroying him and his marriage. He was successful, financially secure and well respected and known in his field, but he felt the whip crack of his emotional conditioning every moment of every day. And he said to me, I'm not being arrogant, but people see me as the best at what I do, but I don't know who I am anymore. Classic phrase. I don't know who I'm supposed to be. I don't do anything unless it somehow ties in with getting better, rising up to be the best. And since the depression had hit him, uh, he'd found himself unable to do much of anything. So what was the problem? If we focus entirely on our status, on rising and maintaining our position in our chosen dominance hierarchy, then status becomes the main object of our lives. Extrinsic reward replaces intrinsic reward. And the more that happens, the less meaningful our lives can feel. So why is that the case? Because only intrinsic reward makes your life feel meaningful. Back in 1973, psychologists Mark R. Lepper and David Green found that rewarding children with praise and attention for doing an activity which they've been enjoying for its own sake had the effect of lessening the child's interest and motivation in that activity. Being rewarded with attention and praise or being told you're good eats away at motivation because the activity no longer provides intrinsic reward but rather extrinsic reward which is dependent on other people. Jeff had come to feel that doing something was only worth doing if it in somehow reflected or increased his status. The idea of inherently or in intrinsically enjoying an activity for its own sake had all but vanished for him. Another client would spend money she didn't have just to enhance her perceived status. She'd spend all her hard-earned cash and then some on lavish haute couture clothes, a fancy car and eye-wateringly expensive jewellery. All just to impress people, she told me. She was tens of thousands of pounds in debt by the time she came to me for help. When we treat clients, we can try to ascertain how much of their life is predicated on how they imagine others see them and how they want to be seen. To what extent are they living each day with that in mind? Sure, some proportion of our efforts can be linked to status and that needn't be a problem, but what is the proportion? If we just want to be the best at the top of a chosen hierarchy, we may become less motivated than say, if 85% of our motivation is for love of or belief in the activity itself. So it's a big distinction there. A key question then is how much of what we do is linked to how we seem to others. When we forget the difference between who we are and who we seem in comparison to others, we're walking the road to unhappiness. We're losing all sense of meaning in life and we're losing ourselves. But what about the dangerous side of getting more status? Because for some, increased status is the last thing that they need. I was in Cambodia visiting one of the killing fields and before us stood a single tree and our guide bravely fought back tears as she told us of her father and how he'd vanished during those nightmarish times of the Khmer Rouge. And our guide's smiling face showed flashes of agony as she pointed out the strands of human hair still ingrained in the bark of a particular tree and this was the killing tree. Not wanting to waste bullets, the communist regime, Kimo Rouge, would swing children against the tree to kill them. Teeth still washed up in the earth when it rained, and we could actually see some teeth in the earth as well. So I asked the guide who had sanctioned this barbarity, and she said, the one at the top, him, Pol Pot. And of course, he hadn't actually done the killing himself, but he'd given the orders to the men and women who had been appointed with the status 
um, or the power to do it for him. A kind of madness can descend on someone when they're granted a dramatic increase in status. Okay, especially if that status comes along with power, and the two are often combined. It's easy to blithely assume that if we were in power, the world would sing in harmony and be bathed in eternal sunshine. But infinite arrogance aside, it does seem that being given authority, the status of official or custodian of power, is toxic for many people. So we shouldn't assume it wouldn't be toxic for us too. In fact, to believe we could handle a great increase in power simply because we assume we are not prey to the dark forces of human nature is to take the first fateful step towards tyranny. Okay, because self-deception and tyranny walk hand in hand. You know, people have done terrible things because of newly conferred status. People who, despite their best intentions, find that power really does corrupt. And this corruption can happen at lightning speed. Status can easily go to our heads and make us cruel and tyrannical. For some people, all it takes is a uniform for them to lose themselves to monstrous cruelty. Back in 1971, Stanford's professor Philip Simbardo conducted the infamous prison experiment, and he wanted to study and observe the effects of perceived power, focusing on the behavioural and emotional interplay between prisoners and prison officers, even though they were role-playing. So interestingly, the study was financed by the US Office of Naval Research as an investigation into the causes of difficulties between guards and prisoners in the US Navy and US Marine Corps. So college students were randomly assigned the role of prisoner or guard. And the effects of this status assignment were immediate and shocking. People were free to leave the experiment any time they wanted, but many prisoners very soon fell into a passive role, accepting any and all treatment they received. Psychological torture of the prisoners by the guards was so quick to assert itself that it took only six days before Simbardo's future wife urged him to stop the experiment. And bear in mind that these were liberal-minded students who may well have denied they would ever be intoxicated by power. It was concluded that it wasn't the students' inherent personality attributes that caused that their behaviour, but the situation itself. We all have a need for control, and the more status we feel, the more power we feel. And that equates to a sense of control. But feeling more control over our own lives can easily tip into a desire to extend that sense of control by controlling other people. This is how tyrannies become established, and I don't just mean those great big obvious Orwellian tyrannies, I mean those petty social circle bullying ones too. It's easy to focus on the sadism of the students assigned high status in the Stanford prison uh, experiment, but I'm also interested in the way most of the prisoners sank into passivity, bearing in mind they could have left at any time. It's important to understand that victim is also a status. So if we look at victimhood status, when we label someone, we assign them a status. When you have a sense of status, whether high or low, you feel that certain behaviours are now expected of you. If we assign someone the role of victim, that is, a low position in the hierarchy, they may come, uh, as the prisoners did in the Stanford experiment, to feel and ultimately be passive. We can see a client's sense of status by just talking and listening to them. How much influence do they feel they have in their lives over themselves and other people? A victim is by definition not a victor over events or circumstances. To describe someone as a victim is to ascribe them low status if the label becomes permanently stuck. Support groups can be valuable in that people feel they're not alone with their condition or in their feelings, but ultimately victim isn't a status that serves anyone well for long. And paradoxically, sometimes the low status of victim, if victimhood itself is respected or encouraged, can place a person quite high in the status hierarchy. And this is a problem when it becomes aspirational to be seen as a victim, consciously or otherwise. But status can also be gleaned by, or entangled with, who you know, and this has its own dangers. If we think about jailhouse love. Notoriety is, of course, a form of high status. Alpha can take many forms. You know, I want to talk about the phenomenon, which, while relatively rare, is still common enough 
to tell us something important about the attraction of status and how we can bask in other people's. A killer behind bars is notorious. Therefore, he, and it often is a he, has high status. And some women will find that intriguing or downright attractive, though men don't seem to so commonly fall for female incarcerated killers, okay, according to research. Now, we can gain status by being with high status people. This is another way of getting status. And of course, if someone is behind bars, the relationship isn't a full one, but the woman can still elicit some kind of reflected status by being romantically involved with a notorious high status male. She may spout all the cliches about feeling she's the only one who really understands him or she can uh, see the good in him or can tame him and so on and so forth. But ultimately, she's chosen a high status male, as weird as this sounds. More prosaically, if you ever wonder what on earth he or she could possibly see in that person, it might just be their status, their level of social or other dominance. Hanging out with the cool, naughty kid at school can, in the same way, confer status on you. It's a mistake, I think, to assume status doesn't matter, that we're above it or that it shouldn't matter, because quite clearly it does in all kinds of ways. Once we learn to recognise the role of status in all kinds of human behaviours, motivation becomes easier to read, I think. And understanding status can, of course, help us understand abuses of power. You know, if we think about ideas of to prop up status, fighting toxic ideologies is all very well, but it misses a vital point. Warped status can lead to tyranny, yes, but tyranny isn't about ideology. Ideas are simply the floating bubbles in the seething molten seas of emotion. They're the rationale and sometimes the excuse for power plays. They simply prop up the status of controlling tyrannical people. And when status becomes more important than substance, we're in trouble. Seeming to be the expert may replace actual expertise or competence. Status can be derived in all kinds of ways, from victimhood to having more stuff, which equates to power, to looking better, being smarter, knowing more gossip, or being the most popular. The point here is none of these characteristics have to be connected to status, unless that's the way these attributes are seen by others, or instinctively felt by the person themselves. Some people use their official status to bully and intimidate. You know, they can't even psychologically handle the uniform of a petty official without becoming tyrannical. Others base their whole sense of self on being some kind of official, or a successful business person, or some other status, and ram it down everyone's throats at every opportunity. But there is a universal corrective to over-rigid dominance hierarchies, and that's humour. Okay, laugh and the whole world gets annoyed. <laughs> okay, so some people may choose jobs that automatically confer status and authority, and we have to hope they can manage that power. Okay, otherwise they make life hell for the rest of us. But I think it's important to be able to relax with a sense of status, to always have to keep our dignity, to always have to seem serious or capable, paradoxically lowers our real power. There's a kind of transcendence of being able to laugh at ourselves or those of high status. Tyrannies don't like humour. They may even try to control the content of jokes because it threatens their status as total purveyors of reality. Only certain jokes are okay. So having humour about status, not having to take ourselves or others too seriously, is a great counterbalance to the loss of perspective status can inflict. The need for status, including online popularity, approval and attention, can stop us living our life from our own perspective. When we go down the rabbit hole of how does this make me seem, rather than what do I think about it myself, we have already begun to lose who we really are. Ultimately, status doesn't necessarily equate to wisdom, intelligence, judiciousness or decency. And yet we might have been conditioned to defer to it unquestionably. And yet being automatically anti-authoritarian might be a way of trying to raise our own status. But we shouldn't be automatically pro-authority either, not blindly so. In the words of Paolo Corlo, 
What other people think of you is none of your business. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com blog. That's unk.com blog. And thanks for watching. Thank <music> you.